Hey, my name's Peter Howard at PA Howdy on Twitter. You might remember me from such YouTube videos as That's Not What Words Mean, and for heaven's sake, buy Tyler Lockett for a late second round pick in 2022, and Juju Smith Schuster is a surefire lock to be a great fantasy asset in 2021. They all worked out great. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about um, predictive stats, or whether we have any. Is what stats are good? Which are the stats? Which stats should I be using to know what's going to happen in the future? Essentially, for rookies and, and, and the NFL, players that are already in the NFL, whose stats tend to be slightly more predictive. Um, and I want to look at that today. Jeff uh, from Fantasy Pros actually asked me this most recently, and I completely forgot about it for about two months. And I was like, oh yeah, I should really make a video. So this... Just in case you are honest, honest to God, someone who's managed to avoid this subject all this time and now you're like just give me the highlights because I want to stick to the highlights and give you a few stats but then explain why there's no what you're looking for doesn't exist um, or what you think you're asking doesn't exist um, and why I think a lot of people get into data for fantasy football I think the most common mistake they make look mistake I made that I've moved away from and actually found better results by moving away from it just an underlying assumption that numbers can do certain things but essentially most tests most statistical testing um, is talking about representing numbers on a graph and then calculating um, how much one number is related to another number on that graph remember that nice linear line where we can draw nice squares and triangles and stuff on a graph in math class that's essentially what r squared is doing it's plotting different things across two, the two different variables you're testing and saying how closely related they are to you now there are other things that go into testing such as probability score and some others that I barely understand, but that's essentially what R squared is trying to do. You plot one number against another number, and then it explains how related those two numbers are to each other. Essentially, because it doesn't tell you how much it predicts, so much as how much or how commonly one number will tell you what another number is going to be. So when you test points per game, for example, to points per game the following year, you plot points per game in year N, to points per game in year n plus one and an r squared test will tell you how closely related those two numbers are to each other and we call that predictive if they're very related to each other and if they're not we call it unpredictive but it's really not predicting and um, the best word for it is explaining how much does it explain what happens in the other data set or in this case in the following year all right, so that's what I'm using as a synonym for predicting, but know that it's not really prediction. It suggests that there is some causation, that there is a good relationship between one stat in one year and another stat in another year, but that relationship can be affected by, you know, life. Because numbers are just representations of things that happened in life, and then you've got, you know, a family and a job and injuries and just not feeling it that year, and real things that affect whether or not that number helps you. They don't represent any particular causation in the real world, they represent an achievement, a thing that happened, and how often that thing continues to happen within a relatively similar range. But context is always going to play a part. Um, the other word that's commonly the other word that's commonly commonly used with this is sticky. How sticky are stats? Those are the two things you really need to know about a number, about how to use it or how much to pay attention to it. Now, sticky means how similar is that stat in one year to how to the next year. So, for example, volume stats are fairly sticky. If a player gets, keeping it simple, twenty percent target share one year it is fairly likely or fairly common that he gets around 20% target share the following year. Um, whereas if they're catching 11.6, or keep it simple, 10 yards per reception, an efficiency stat, it's fairly unlikely that that stat will tell you much about 
the following year in predictiveness, so it'll score a low R squared test. And as far as stickiness goes, it's actually relatively unlikely that they score very similar to that 10 yards per reception the following year. Despite the fact that Tyler Lockett or Tyreek Hill continue to play downfield roles, their yards per reception and their efficiency stats in that vein are going to be unsticky as well as unpredictive. Four points per game, say. Um, so volume stats tend to be sticky, relatively stable, but we know target share and volume moves up and down every year, which is kind of where the problem starts, because um, the predictive and the sticky stats still consistently change relatively a lot, actually, um, even for players that have high volume roles consistently throughout their careers. Um, and sticky means the stat itself is likely to be relatively similar the following year. Because remember, you can maintain a 20% target share and your points per game can be wildly different depending on how effective the score the team is at getting into the red zone, for example. So there's somewhat of a difference. Now again, um, the most predictive stats are always going to be volume related stats. So, you know, uh, targets per game is going to be better than yards per target because that's an efficiency stat. How many yards were you creating per target? It's how efficient you were at creating yards per opportunity, or per target in this case. Same with yards per carry, which is even worse across the board in all regards. Um, and volume stats, just how many opportunities, how many targets, rushing attempts, passing attempts you are getting, are gonna be the more predictive and the more sticky stats from year to year. All right, so that's, that's that stuff. Those are those. Those are the words I'm going to use. So I thought I'd do a quick that. What what do they mean? Thing. Um. All right. So which are predictive? This right here is a R squared table that I've got in my NFL database. You don't have to pay the dollar to get access to my databases. It's here. I post it on Twitter a lot. Essentially, it's running a consistent test every time I add a whole new year of data. It updates or update the data itself. It updates. I've got it running continuously now, not because it changes a lot and you need to stay up to date with it, just because then I always know it's relevant when someone asks and I go copy and paste it again. Um, across the top here, just to explain a little, a little bit, um, I have minimum volume thresholds for positions. So this is touches and opportunities, so it's not particularly relevant uh, to fantasy, but I wanted to remove everyone who's not touching the ball a significant amount before testing it. So essentially this is an R squared test for stickiness and predictiveness of the stat itself in sticky and also towards points per game in predictiveness. And It's only using players that touch the ball a minimum number of times for that position to still be getting fairly relevant touches. So tight ends that get at least three opportunities a game. It's not much, it's not particularly fantasy relevant, but it means they're consistently involved in the game and therefore their stats are relevant to the sample. It also filters for having played more than eight games and gotten, gotten uh, over those touch thresholds every game on average. So those are the actual results and you notice, notice non-crest over, if you're looking at it at all, 50%. Non are 50% predictiveness either of the stat itself or of their performance the following year. Stats themselves will not predict a 50% accuracy of what a player is going to do the following year. To get over that, which ADP and, uh, and predictive models and projection models consistently do, we score depending on who's doing the testing and how they're testing it and whether they want to make themselves look good on Twitter. And between 50 and 54% effectiveness in projection models. Now Mike Clay might be doing better than that, but that's the results I have seen and he falls within that range as mine did. Not that I'm Mike Clay as Tanhose did when he did Wisdom of the Crowd projections. As every projector I've seen across all positions and sometimes and quite often individual projectors will do better and worse individual positions. But that's my bar. Getting close to 54% accuracy in a projection model, I think is pretty lit. If it's measured fairly and across the board and you don't play that I've got more 
you, you, you can rig those tests a little bit and it's not a bad thing because we all need to prove we can do things but we can rig it but in reality in terms of actual fantasy utility I think a projection model does pretty good to get over 50% because no single stat does. ADP, based on, again, my testing, which can be flawed, and I'm just a fake nerd grinder, I get it. Um, where was I? ADP. ADP gets around 50, 52-53% right if you are very generous across all positions in fact it does better at, again does better at certain positions year over year especially within certain position rounds for example in the top 10 and the top 12 of running back we tend to do better in adp than repeat rates do so we do fairly well in adp in the top 12 of running backs whether you're looking at redraft or dynasty um, and it's difficult to test between those two for example dynasty isn't always trying to project points with its ADP it's trying to project value which is why I tend to look at it through that lens and I find it fairly as accurate as redraft at doing value as redraft does points but subject for another day all right so no stat is going to predict act within a f uh, what does that mean fit 50 percent like the highest score I've got on here is probably around 47 47 percent um, explanation of the following year's points per game and that's from my sophomore model specifically at tight end the one thing that you should know if you're looking for a stat that's predictive how likely is a player to go the following year it's points per game I've got yards per routes run in here now I have yards per snap I've tested a lot I haven't tested everything and I certainly haven't tested your favorite data nerds favorite model or anything like that but I've looked at air yards, I've looked at yards per route run, I've looked at target share per game and all the stats that I like and have used and everyone that I can find that I can mention that I can stuff into this history. And, and points per game pretty much beats them or it's relatively similar. Like I created a model called the sophomore model and it beats points per game at individual points, specifically looking within certain career years and at different positions. But I'm not going to tell you it's better than just ranking players for the following year based on their points per game the year before, because honestly, it's as close as exactly the same. It's going to rank different players differently, and I sign some value in that, but yeah, neither here nor there. Now, the question my friend Jeff asked me is essentially he understands that basically, but how, how to use it. Um, or I think why does it get some wrong is a better way of looking at stats and that's where we actually learn stuff for example points per game kicks ass if you filter for a significant touch threshold and if you only look at players who played over eight games for example and I'm not saying he's going to fail because he actually performed well in a smaller sample and that is interesting especially when you consider Blair Andrews work um, Kadarius Tony in 2021 as a rookie performed excessively well on a per touch, per route, per game kind of a basis, but he didn't play significantly well. He didn't run over 150 routes, which is about bare minimum um, for a rookie in their first year, to be honest with you. Now, there are ways of adjusting for that. But if you adjust it and then project it, essentially you're moving out of the area where points per game or yards per out run or any of this predictiveness testing essentially matters. Because this testing, these stats are only good if you filter out players on a small sample. They have to have played more than eight games or they have to have touched the ball more than a certain number of times within a certain game. If you reduce that, then one, the predictiveness and the stickiness actually drops. They become less predictive. So one of the first things we can learn from any stat is if you just cross out anyone who didn't play enough, whether they were efficient or they had volume on a per game basis or not, their stats, the stats of the group actually become more predictive, which should tell you to fade players with small samples. Now, that's all relative to ADP. For example, Kadarius Tony hasn't received a significant bump in his ADP from last year. And I'm not telling anyone not to take their guy or not to take their shot, especially not on Tony or anyone else. But I can tell you the stats tell me, <laughs> as much as they talk, that players on small samples are more likely, heavily likely, to be traps, especially if, even if they were efficient or getting significant volume in a small sample and by small sample I simply mean they play less than eight games or they touch the ball less than depending on the position 
three times a game, five times a game at wide receiver, or nine times a game at running back, or 33 times a game, including the rushing attempts, at quarterback. That's one of the things I honestly think has benefited my understanding of fantasy football, or my projections, or my rankings, or my accuracy of drafting players. It's just knowing that, according to the stats, this, um, their predictiveness and stickiness is entirely dependent on literally ignoring anyone who didn't play enough. That's one of the ways we get the signal out of it. So that tells me players who did well in small samples are more likely to be traps than anything else. Now, sometimes that's difficult to rectify with what we see or what we feel about a player. But if I can remain neutral on it, I will. Um, because it's more likely I'll get it right. It's that simple. So I think that's honestly the answer that I'm just going to keep repeating in different ways to you, Jeff. It's, there are certain stats that are more predictive and more sticking we should be paying attention to. Yards per carry is one you should literally just throw away. Points per game is as good enough for anything that you want to look at it. You just use points per game, honestly. That's probably the best stat. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Subscribe to the channel. Please don't make me keep asking this. I don't, I don't like doing it. Thank you. Subscribe. So points per game, is that really it, Pete? Yeah, on a, honestly, that's about it. But in the same way, you could say, I, I don't know tape. I really don't. I enjoy watching games. I know nothing about the process of using tape to explain if a player is good or not. I know nothing. So I'm not going to pretend to have a cinnamon here. But it's all stats have value. In the same way, all observations are interesting and of value, although sometimes you don't know how to use them. But we do know certain things about certain stats. I'll explain the difference between volume and efficiency and how even efficiency, even though it's not predictive or sticky, can have utility if you understand what it is. And Blair Andrews found some utility for it by looking at rookies just by dividing the group into efficiency, efficient and inefficient players above or below an average. He found they were more likely to increase in volume. So despite the stat, the stat isn't predictive or sticky, it still had use. In the same way that target share doesn't beat points per game, but it could tell you something about their individual context. And that's the second part of this. That's how we use stats. It's not use the right stat, although I do know, and I fell into this pretty early on, the idea I was going to find the right stats, multiply them together in the right way, and I was going to know 54% of what was going to happen next year already without having to do any extra work. I don't think that exists. I don't think that's what a projection model is either. Um, I haven't talked to a lot of people that do projections since. Essentially, they run through the process I'm about to explain to you and then put it out as a model, as if the model did it for them. <clears throat> now, the model is often very sophisticated and interesting and hard to build and of value and go buy those players' projections, you know? But they do a lot of handwork. Wait. They do a lot of the work themselves to put it through the process, which is essentially adjustments and also creating regression models and everything else, essentially to do this. You take their stats, volume over efficiency, points per game is a pretty good stand-in for yards per route run if you don't have it, yards per team attempt if you don't got it, yards per or air yards. Um, and then you look at the individual context of their season, which is where their other stats come into play. Was a player getting a high volume and efficient in their in their fifth year, then they're probably pretty likely to continue. Were they highly efficient but getting below average volume in their rookie year? Then we should expect them to increase in volume, although that efficiency is probably going to decrease into their following year, because efficiency indicates that the team is more likely to give them volume, but their efficiency is also probably going to regress back towards an average, because efficiency, uh, that's where regression comes in. We regress over and under a baseline average in most things, in all things, actually, and um, where we perform excessively efficiently and excessively inefficiently in kind of a, a peak and valley um, manner over time. So most players are going to regress towards the average. Now, when you have a significant player history, those are just two base examples but when you have someone like Aaron Rodgers who's consistently had a higher level of touchdown efficiency than anyone basically and um, 
looking at him in year whatever it is right now, well into his career with a high level of touchdown efficiency, like well above the average. Um, and last year he also performed fairly well on it and was a top scoring QB again. We should expect that efficiency to drop, but not towards the positional average, but towards his personal average, which has consistently been higher than the positional average over time. And so a good projection model will take that into account as well. So it's not that his efficiency or his volume or his points per game get beaten by another stat, it's by applying the context of that player to his stats last year, you can get a closer to accurate projection of what his median outcome next year is going to be. Now some projection models are gonna try and predict uh, ceilings and floors and all sorts of crazy stuff because we got literal PhDs doing this now. But that's essentially why projection models will get closer to ADP and why ADP will get closer to the truth than points per game or any particular stat from one year. It's essentially from one reason for another, applying context to their stats. So it's not really the best stats, it's how how to adjust the best stats, maybe. And um, now for you and me, just looking at next year, if you're not trying to create a projection model, points per game is good enough. But then you should go and look at their other stats, look at their volume, look at their efficiency, and look at where they're at in their career. Apply the context of their actual team. Is the team likely to get better? Not because you're a fan and you really believe in Justin Fields. If you can just remove that part of it from yourself, and just go look at Justin Fields as a second year quarterback who was very decent in college but disappointed his rookie year and go find examples and see what typically happened the following year and the following years after that. There's not a lot of expectation that he should drastically increase. So if you go look at the Chicago Bears and he's got so many points per game going into his second career, we should expect better performance as a player increasingly matriculates, should we say, into the NFL. He's going to improve. The rookie year is the hardest year, probably literally for every position, but quarterback's got to be the hardest. So I'm not saying he's bad or he can't drastically outperform expectation, but we also shouldn't expect if he has a highly efficient stat in touchdown rate, like Aaron Rodgers, that his will regress to a higher average for himself because we don't have enough history on him. And also given the history of quarterbacks and how they progress in the league, and from my from the research I've done, a prediction model that I built would not regress him up from where he was last year significantly. And so it would probably expect him to be likely disappointing based on um, a lot of people's hopes and dreams for him this year, including his. And he could out vastly outperform those. Um, but when we're talking projections and what stats can tell us, they're going to predict us on what is most reasonable based on what has happened before. They're not gonna tell you who secretly was good and other people don't realize it. In fact, if players were bad, it's gonna project more often than not that they're going to continue to be bad because that's on average what normally happens. Now you can find some stats where players are surprisingly better, like I was talking about with Kadarius Tony, than their overall points per game or people might recognize in ADP. But that's not from any one particular stat, that's from reading the context of their stats. What was their volume? What was their efficiency through any stats you particularly like to look at? Whether it's air yards, which is a good one. Weighted opportunity rating is probably one of the best stats for applying context of individual seasons. Whether they were getting a lot of valuable air yards and underperforming it might suggest that if they are likely to continue to get that volume, they should outperform their previous year's expectation. But it's not that Whopper therefore always indicates that you are you've got a player who's going to do better next year. What career year are they in? What is the context of their season? Why were they getting so many weighted opportunity air yards? And it's awkward, especially for people who just want a stat. And especially me, I thought I was going to use stats to get me to that 54% without having to do any of that context or narrative type work. It's narrative with safety rails. It's removing the, I really want Justin Fields to be good barrier away and letting what has happened most often actually be the guide. Now, after you've done all that, you can also just go, screw it, I'm drafting Justin Fields or I'm, I'm drafting Kadarius Tony above ADP because I saw something that's good or I'm gonna believe in that efficiency. But that's not what makes a model or what makes a stat good or bad about telling us what's going to happen. Now, hopefully that highlights some of the process. Because um, there is no individual stat that you're going to look at, I think. And um, one model that you can create 
they can do that secretly good, but no one recognizes it because they're not looking at this mystery stat. Essentially, the best way of thinking about it is those players that come from nowhere that outperform ADP or a projection model um, the following year, the truth of it is going to be found in different stats. There isn't one stat you should always look at. It's going to be a different stat and that indicated they could do that that's a lot of people missed or a lot of people noticed and had them as their favorite sleeper and now they're geniuses and they're going to be higher by espn or whatever yeah that's honestly it that's the process jeff and everyone else who asked me that that's why there isn't this isn't the answer this list of most predictive stats across all positions points per game yards per team pass attempt per game my particular sophomore model yards per snap comes in next on average or actually no it doesn't i haven't resorted this uh what do i use that's a good question it's one i'm actively use asking of myself right now i'm creating a projection model which i'm not going to belabor too much but i'm looking for a stat to import in to show how different my projection model puts them on their average performance to essentially say whether my projection model is overly high or overly low. The one I've got imported in right now is yards per team attempt because my sophomore model requires snaps and stuff and I'm, I'm not projecting it. So I can't use it in my projections or calculate it from my projections. But yards per team attempt, I can. Would it be better to use points per game? Actually, I would feel like it's fairly equal. I'm mean, yards per team attempt, then I can break it down into individual volume um, and look at how well my projection model is predicting the team volume as well as the player volume in relation to that team. And so I think that's gonna be the stat I go through. How different is my projection model expecting their performance to be above or below the average? The other thing I'm gonna be looking at is touchdown rates. How many yards per touchdown am I expecting a player to perform at? Because players consistently regress up and down below their personal average and also the positional average, it's fairly easy to track who is more likely to regress and in which fashion um, the following season. And a projection model's yards per touchdown will also tell me if I'm expecting similar regression from what they did the previous year. And so I'm probably gonna have to import some level of column to show how accurately um, the projection model is doing that to identify where it might be too high or might be too low based on previous performance. But they're not magic stats. It's not like yards per touchdown is the truth, or yards per team attempt is the secret source that is going to tell you who is secretly good, but being underrated. It's more about using a reasonable projection and, uh, and seeing who, using within the context of their actual season and the player themselves, um, is being under or overrated. That's my process anyway. That's how I think stats are useful. There's not a secret stat. There are good uh, stats are better or worse to either describe volume or describe efficiency. And then you can read or understand their production in the context of one, what the team was and what the team is likely to be the following season. And two, who the player is and where they're at in their career. Hopefully that's of some use because I can pretend um, and honestly, you can make a very good case. Here are the best stats. You should just be looking at these stats. The problem is ADP and projection models don't. And so I think uh, the best way to understand or use stats for you, me, and the layman's uh, above, above us is to understand that it's using the best stat that you can get a hold of and you're comfortable with accurately represents volume and then accurately represents efficiency and the context of how that efficiency and volume is made like with air yards like with expected points they were getting more volume than they were performing on expected points is really interesting and then applying the context of their team situation and their volume just through an understanding of what's happening in the nfl um yeah that's it hopefully that answered some question that you might have asked but I really don't have a, an answer to the question, what are the secret metrics that tell you when a player is secretly good and no one realizes it? Because there is no one stat. There are stats that are better and worse at predicting and being sticky. But again, sometimes they're not where the secret was hiding. Sometimes it's hiding in efficiency and the relative nature of that stat to their career year, for example like with Brother Andrews. So yeah, 
that's it. That's as good as I can do. I think. For now. Also, I'm late for work now. So I'm going to go. Hope it helps, Jeff. And um, let me know. This table, again. Uh, the R squared table, I've posted it on Twitter. Just search PA Howdy and RSQ or tag me on Twitter and ask and I'm happy to post it again or you can find it in my NFL database um, for the high high price of a single dollar a month anyway really appreciate it thanks for checking out if you did I hope it was some way useful I'm moving away from this explanation type video on YouTube because I find most people are bored by it but every now and again I ask get asked a question that does deserve an answer or I think I have some insight into that might help and so I'll make it. There we go. Uh, let me know what you think. Thanks very much. Talk to you again on the next one. Bye. Hey, thanks for checking out another video. If you could like, subscribe, comment, that'd all be great. But also check out the rest of the channels. I follow my Patreon link to see what I'm up to over there. And the link tree link, I guess, is going to take you uh, to easy access to my podcast, the articles I'm writing over there at DLF, as well as it, most of the other things I'm up to. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks very much.